Here, we don't grow one crop or two crops. We do 40, 50, maybe even more than that. You know, we have lettuce, we have snap peas, onions, celery, parsley, cilantro, potatoes, Tulsi basil, regular basil, broccolini, broccoli, calendula, marigold, peppermint. We just have an abundance of things. We are providing this food to our community members living under food apartheid, folks who don't have easy access to a local grocery store with fresh fruits and vegetables. We're providing them food from our farm completely free of charge. The soil is just so rich and full, and so we call it black gold. It's really important to us that we talk about all the oppression that our ancestors have experienced and our people continue to experience related to slavery, sharecropping, tenant farming, but also that folks know that black people's relationship to land has a noble and dignified history and that black agrarianism has made possible the feeding of the world. So we're at Soulfire Farm. In total, the Soulfire property is 80 acres. The land was purchased in 2006, but we opened up in 2010. So Soulfire Farm is a nonprofit organization and community farm. Our funding comes through lots of grants. We are a black and brown led community farm dedicated to uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty in the food system. And we do this in three basic ways. One is that we grow a whole lot of food and medicine using our ancestral methods and box it up every week and deliver it to people who need it most in the community. The second thing we do is educate and equip the next generation of black and brown growers, from urban gardeners to rural farmers, youth and elders. And then the third major thing that we do is advocacy and public education because one of the reasons the food system is so oppressive and environmentally destructive is because of lousy institutions and lousy policies. Hi, Cheryl. Oh yeah, she's over in the strawberry patch. We are harvesting strawberries for our solidarity share. We are growing these strawberries with minimal additional pesticides or things like that. They taste like candy, <laughs> pretty much. Um, like I had a few for breakfast and they're very filling, but I also feel like I'm getting some kind of a treat because they taste so sweet. So I am harvesting snap peas. Harvesting is one of the most therapeutic things, you know? You can just be so mindful. Every time I do it, I always think of just this whole process that the, these little plants have gone through, and I feel so grateful. So the food that we're harvesting today is gonna go into our Solidarity Share CSA and we deliver these shares to about 25 families and a couple of institutions, refugee center, food bank, um, church, every Thursday from late June to early November, and there's, there's no cost. Make jam, jam, strawberry jam. Oh my God, it smells so good, the garlic cake. Yeah, so this is one of our solidarity shares. And so what we have in here is we have some oregano, which is one of our perennial herbs. And so these come back every year on their own. And then we have peppermint, we have chard. These are our garlic scapes. We've got some turnips, radishes, lettuce. We all know what lettuce is. And then we got some honey, actually. And then we have the strawberries here. And then we have the snap peas, which you saw me harvesting earlier. We have our fresh eggs. And so that's what we're giving away this week. The racial inequities in the food system have happened since the creation of the food system. You know, it's been based on stolen land and stolen labor. And unfortunately, as the emancipation happened, none of that stopped. So even though there were freed, enslaved people, the inequities specifically around growing food continued. The neighborhood of the South End where my children grew up is a neighborhood under food apartheid. That meant that there were no grocery stores, no farmer's markets, no available community garden plots, and it was very difficult to access fresh, healthy, culturally appropriate food. 
And this is the case for many black and brown neighborhoods across the nation where we're suffering from food apartheid because of a history of redlining, housing discrimination, and divestment that's made it very difficult um, to get the foods that we need to live healthy, active, and thriving lives. In these areas, there is food, but it's bodegas and convenience stores and fast food restaurants, and there just aren't a lot of good quality grocery stores selling good quality produce. But we know that a piece of broccoli is better than a bag of chips, but how do we go about doing that, and how do we ensure that everybody in our community has access to that head of broccoli? When you look at a lot of the chronic illnesses impacting our black and brown communities, a lot of the times it's illnesses that are diet related, like diabetes, hypertension, and with that in mind, if our folks just had the choice to choose more healthy food options, we would probably see less instances of these diseases plaguing our communities. So it's really important that organizations like Soul Fire Farm exists that are making it easier for folks to have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. When our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm, they started encouraging us to start a farm for the people that would bring that fresh cultural food to the South End. Our CSA is very small, it's 25 people. We're not aiming to feed the world. Our primary focus is educating other black and brown farmers on how to grow their own food and also how to open their own organizations and community farms to spread that abundance and wealth. People come to the farm during the summer, they stay for six days, and they learn all about farming. They learn about ancestral practices of farming, you know, like no-till, regenerative agriculture, mulching, composting, all of these beautiful things. But they also learn the business side of things. So how to actually build a business plan, how to get funding, how to find land, and then how to implement that all into their communities. Thousands of people come through here to learn every year. We hope that everybody can go back to their communities and do the same thing. One of the things that's most satisfying about our immersion programs is that our alumni often go on to start their own farms or take leadership uh, in existing farming projects. And watching the ripple effects of our education just echo out across the landscape has been really powerful. For example, the Katatumbo Farm Co-op in Chicago. Another powerful example is the Harriet Tubman Freedom Farm in North Carolina. We're super psyched about High Hog Farm in Grayson, Georgia. So we've been really, really blessed to get to be engaged with these farmers' lives and hope that what they learned at Soul Fire is supporting and augmenting their, their work in the community. Chaga. Chaga is our farm dog. His job includes protecting the livestock on the farm and also just playing a lot. That's what he's really good at. This is a Stockbridge Muncie Mohican blue corn. It's native to this region. We grow this every year so that we can save the seeds and send them to the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican peoples. They are the original inhabitants of this land. These are our chickens, these are our laying hens, and these are the beautiful creatures that provide fresh eggs to our Solidarity Share members every week. This is a chicken from Solfire Farm, and I'm going to like bro just broil it. And what spices I have in here is black pepper, star anise, turmeric, ginger, lemongrass, soy sauce and my homemade hoisin sauce. Normally it's so spicy, but this time I make it spicy because we have many little ones. It smells so good. I like to eat with my hand. Like, so in Indonesia we eat with our hand, but with rice like that. I eat with my hand too. Mm -hmm. So when we first wed ourselves to this land back in 2006, the soil was really eroded and degraded. All the levels of macro and micronutrients were really low, the organic matter was low, the soil was heavy clay. You know, it was very difficult to even get a shovel into the soil, that's how compacted it was. And when our county agent from the U.S. Department of Agriculture came out, they said, you know, there's no way you all can farm here, this soil is, is just done. And we decided to, to stick it out and make it work. They took, you know, years, I think it was like four total years of building up the soil so that they could grow food in it. Over the years, you know, our organic matter went from 
just a couple percentage points to over 10%, which basically tells us that we've reached pre-colonial indigenous levels of soil carbon, which is a, a huge, huge accomplishment. We've sequestered tens of thousands of pounds of carbon in the soil. We've also seen an increase in the native biodiversity, and we're proud of that. You know, of the 80 acres that we live on, 70 of them are for the wildlife and, and 10 are for the people. We have very rich soil because we don't till. Underneath there, it's just like black gold. Black gold is a poetic way that we refer to soil because soil is the foundation of our civilization and our survival. So there are so many beautiful techniques in organic and regenerative agriculture, and a lot of people think of them as ahistorical or European. The truth is that almost every sustainable ag technique has roots in Afro-Indigenous history. Some examples of that include the raised beds of the Ovambo people of Namibia. Another example of that would be compost itself. The first documented composter was Cleopatra, who in 59 BCE had a whole cadre of priests whose full-time work was dedicated to the study of earthworms. Another example is Dr. George Washington Carver at Tuskegee University arguably one of the founders of the modern organic movement, who in the late 1800s had a whole generation of black farmers doing cover cropping, which is you know planting crops that are specifically designed to feed the soil, not people. I mean, people thought Dr. Carver was really nuts. So, you know, to, to plant a plant and not eat it, you know, to, to give it back to the earth was, was quite unheard of at that point in time. We try to make sure that our students who come to the farm learn that proud history and understand that when they choose a life of farming, they're not forsaking their ancestors or adopting somebody else's culture. They're really building on a legacy that they've inherited. We are weeding the blueberries and these thistles. These thistles are hardcore weed. This type of gardening is a Haitian Creole style gardening. It's called a Jardin La Coupe. People also refer to it commonly as a polyculture. So, you know, I know many people are accustomed to seeing big cornfields that are all one crop, which is a monoculture. And this is the stark opposite. And the idea is, you know, this group of plantings is working in unison. So it's like all these plants have a different function. This is comfrey. It's a really awesome plant called a dynamic accumulator. It essentially feeds what it took up from the soil to the plants around it and to the soil again. So it's a nice mulch plant. We got mullein, which you don't see the flower yet, but it comes up really high and there's yellow flowers and it's really good medicine as well. Uh, we use it for eardrops. Like if our sons have an ear infection, you can make like a ear oil. These plants not only like deter critters from sort of attacking the tree, um, but also attract pollinators. Right now, we are grabbing some edible flowers, allium flowers or chive flowers, and also some bachelor buttons. There's something so special about this area. I love living here. And I actually live in that little cabin right across the pond. But I never thought I would live on a farm or have a baby on a farm or be married to a farmer slash carpenter. So my children, Nishima, age 18, and Emmett, age 16, have grown up on this farm. They've lived here most of their lives. My daughter now says that as soon as she's done with college, she's coming back home to build her life here. We'll see if that comes true, but it's an incredible statement to make. For me, I realized that farming is for everyone. That was something that I didn't know, and that is a beautiful fact. And for me, that's so fulfilling to know that I can grow my own food, I can sustain my life. And if the whole world goes to, you know, crap, I'm gonna be okay, I can take care of my family, I can feed my family. Somehow, we were convinced that we didn't belong in nature all of a sudden, and that we belonged in the urban centers. So that created not only this idea that, oh, you know, nature's not for black people, farming is not for black people, but it also took us farther and farther away from the sources of our food. 
and from the knowledge around growing food. Because if you also think about being forced to work the land, why would you want to return to the land? You know, there's a lot of generational trauma around farming in particular, and that's something that we also try to dismantle so that people can remember that, like, that's something that happened to us. That was something that was inflicted upon us, but that is not our natural relationship to land and growing food. And so how do we reclaim that relationship? It's a long journey, hard process, but I really feel passionate about the work that Soul Fire is doing here to address that. And we, we have so much determination, so much passion for this work. Anytime I have, you know, have a chance to come out to the farm and, and do this work, it's grounding, it's restorative. The earth is good, the land is good. And you know, having an opportunity to collaborate with the earth to pull forth food and medicine and joy, there's no greater honor. <laughs>